Good evening and welcome to worship on this Christmas Eve, December 2020. A very, very special welcome to those joining us over our YouTube channel at BridgewaterBaptist.com and also those joining us over Bridgewater Baptist radio station 98.7 FM. Tonight, uh, as we celebrate this Christmas Eve service, it is very different than one that I've ever experienced, and I guess I'm imagining for most of us uh, to have experienced a Christmas Eve quite like this. But it is special to know that even though we are separated by distance in our homes or listening over radio or wherever you are this evening, that we are also connected. Even th across the distance, we are connected with one another and with brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ around the world. And tonight, as we come to this service to celebrate Christmas Eve, we are reminded that we have friends and uh, fellow Christians joining us from Africa and from India, from across Canada and the United States. As families gather and friends come tonight to light these candles and to remember Remember that Christ is born. Welcome to Christmas Eve. As we gather together this Christmas Eve, let us remember the words of the prophet Isaiah. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness on them, a light has shone. For to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given, and the government shall be, be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his reign and peace, there shall be no end. Rejoice. 
birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end.
Once again, we want to welcome everyone who's joining us online and those listening over 98.7 FM. Uh, that's our broadcast here at Bridgewater Baptist Church, which we'll be playing all through Christmas Eve. Today, tonight, as we gather together uh, for this time of reflection on Christmas Eve, uh, we want to recognize that this is not the Christmas that many of us imagined. It certainly wasn't the Christmas that Dorothy and Gilbert imagined back at the beginning of Advent. On that first Sunday of Advent, after church, they had gone home and started decorating their home on Glen Allen Drive. Now, many of you will remember Dorothy and Gilbert from last Christmas and their run-in with that, uh, uh, that stray angel. And here they were once again in November decorating their home. The works, the lights and the artificial tree and uh, those uh, blow mold uh, angels in their front yard, they were busy putting everything together. It was an extraordinarily mild November here in Bridgewater, Nova Scotia, and they took advantage of that mild weather to start putting their house in order and getting ready for Christmas. Well, Gilbert was coming down off the ladder and kind of grunting, I think the weather's got a fever, Dot, he said. This is so warm. Why are we doing this anyway? Why are we putting up all these decorations? We're not even going to be here this Christmas. We're going to be here on Christmas Eve, said Dorothy, as she corrected him. See, Dorothy and Gilbert had a plan. They were going to spend uh, Advent here in Bridgewater with their friends and their community and even celebrate the Christmas Eve service here at Bridgewater Baptist. And then on Christmas morning, they were going to get on an airplane and head up to Quebec and spend the Christmas holidays with their family, their son Sean, his wife Lorraine, and the two kids, Mark and Luke. But that plan, it wasn't exactly going to come together the way they imagined. No, they did not imagine that on Christmas Eve they would be here in Glen Allen with the red and blue lights of the RCMP in their driveway trying to explain this mysterious person with a red cape running up Glen Allen with black high-heeled boots, uh, supposedly breaking into people's houses. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's back up just a little bit. So it was the beginning of November, or sorry, it was the beginning of Advent, the end of November, and Dorothy and Gilbert were making their plans uh, for Advent. Now, Dorothy had certain things that she just expected would happen during Advent. But this year with COVID-19, so many of those things weren't happening. Uh, the, the big party with her friends canceled. Activities at the church postponed. Shopping trips to Halifax closed. Things that she thought they would be doing because they always did them on Christmas didn't happen this year. It had been a hard year. For most people, 2020 has been a hard year. And it had been a hard year for Dorothy and Gilbert. One of the hardest things was that Dorothy lost her sister, Etta. Etta passed away, and they couldn't have the funeral with all the family gathering the way that Dorothy would have expected. There was a small gathering, a graveside, with just a few people. And they were promised that someday in the future they would get together, and they'd have a proper funeral but it didn't happen this year. And so Dorothy wanted to celebrate Christmas in memory of Etta. You see, Dorothy always put together a, a basket of baking, mostly cookies, to give to special friends. It was, a, it was a source of great pride for Dorothy. And so this year she decided that she was going to go through the cookbooks that she had received from Etta before she passed, and that she was going to find something in Etta's memory to give to her friends. And so it was around the second or third week of Advent that she was going through the book and suddenly announced to Gilbert she had found it. I know what I'm making this year for Christmas, she said. Everyone's going to get a clafouti. A what? said Gilbert. A clafouti. It's French. A cranberry clafouti. Gilbert had no idea what she was talking about. So she opened up the recipe book and showed him a picture. It looks like a tart, he said. It's French. It's not a tart, said Dorothy. It's a clafouti. Now here, she started jotting down a list of ingredients. I'm going to need you to go and pick up some things for me. 
Oh, great, said Gilbert. <laughs> what do you need now? Well, don't worry, she said. It's a cranberry clafu tea, and I have got a whole bag of frozen cranberries from Carl Seelig in the freezer. I don't need you to buy me cranberries, but there's a few ingredients here that I'm going to need. Gilbert started going through the list. Grand Marnier? Turbino sugar? What's turbino sugar? It's French, <laughs> said Dorothy. I need it for the recipe. Couldn't I just get plain old sugar? No, said Dorothy. This is the way Etta's recipe reads. And so that day she decided that she, in getting ready for Christmas, uh, she was going to go all out. She decided that she wanted Gilbert to drop her off at the salon. But you've already got your hair done, said Gilbert. It's not for my hair, said Dorothy. I'm going to get my nails done. Your nails done, said Gilbert. What do you need your nails done for? I want to look, I want to look my best. We're going to see Sean and Lorraine, and I just want to, I want to look my best, said Dorothy. And so Gilbert took the shopping list and dropped Dorothy off at the salon to get her nails done. Now, Dorothy didn't normally get her nails done, but she wanted to have long acrylic nails, just like Lorraine. So she sat down on the seat, and the, the woman attending her brought her out a display of nails. Which ones, she asked. There's more than one, said Dorothy. Oh, there's many options, said the beautician. So Dorothy started going through, and she figured she might as well, she's only going to do this once, go for the best. And so she picked the most expensive nails on the board. Those are two-inch nails, said the beautician. Only the best, said Dorothy. Two-inch nails. That's what I want. And then she brought out all the colors, and Dorothy had a hard time deciding, but she had already known that she was going to wear her bright red dress on Christmas Eve. And so she decided she wanted red nails. She started going through the colors, and that looks like a good one. Uh, that's called dragon's breath, said the beautician. Sounds good to me, said Dorothy. And so there she was sitting, getting her nails done, two-inch acrylic nails with dragon's breath red polish on them when the phone rang. I can't pick up the phone, said Dorothy. Don't worry, said the beautician. She answered the phone and held it up. What is it, she said. It was Gilbert. He was at the store. Do you know how expensive Torbino sugar is, said Gilbert? I mean, you can go to Walmart and buy a bag of white sugar for $2. This stuff is 10 times as much. There was a pause. The pause was awkward and long enough that Gilbert realized that there was something coming, that Dorothy was actually counting to 10 in her head. And so before she got to 10, Gilbert interrupted. I'll get the sugar. And he hung up. A couple of hours passed, and Gilbert finally arrived at the salon, knowing that Dorothy would take a while to get her nails finished. They made their way home. They had all the ingredients. It was time to get ready for Christmas. But it was that week, coming into the third Sunday of Advent, that they got a call, a disappointing call, from Sean. You see, the COVID numbers were continuing to rise in Ontario and in Quebec. And Sean was not feeling comfortable having his parents fly there and to be there for Christmas. And so Sean and Lorraine asked them not to come. Now, many of you know what that feels like to get that kind of news and to have your plans and your travels and everything interrupted. And it was very sad for Dorothy and for Gilbert. But they bucked up and they said, we're going to make the most of Christmas here in Bridgewater. But then another week came and went, and it was the fourth week of Advent when they had the news, even from our church, that they would not have a Christmas Eve service to come to here in the building, that they would be staying home and listening on the radio or watching online. And again, it was just another one more thing interrupted in this year. And Dorothy kind of went to a dark place. She got quite sad and and she stopped playing Christmas carols, and she kind of slumped around the house, and she didn't talk about her clafouti, and she didn't talk about getting presents together for her friends. She was just in that dark, low place. Gilbert was starting to get worried. He didn't know what to say to her. He didn't want to upset her. He wanted her 
to be cheerful, to have a little bit of that joy to come back. Well, the days progressed, and then it was Christmas Eve morning. Christmas Eve morning, it should have been the most exciting day in the year, but Gilbert didn't even set his alarm. He figured he'd sleep in, hopefully sleep, sleep through as much of the day as possible. Oh, and then he heard the noise, <laughs> the clatter in the kitchen downstairs. It was 10 in the morning as Gilbert got into bed and he could smell the coffee. As he came down, he discovers that Dorothy is there, like Julia Childs, <laughs> in her red dress, with her red nails and lipstick on, fully dressed to the nines with a white apron, and she has turned the kitchen into a patisserie. <laughs> she is putting together the most beautiful French desserts that you could imagine. And at the center of it all, the center of the show, the cranberry clafouti. Come and get some coffee, said Dorothy. Gilbert looked, and there on the dining room table was a uh, thermos with coffee and some cinnamon loaf. Get something to eat. I need you to go get me more ingredients. More ingredients, said Gilbert. What do you mean, more ingredients? I'm making them for everyone, she said. He looked around. How many of these tarts are you making, said Gilbert. 200, said Dorothy. What are you, are you going through the phone book, <laughs> said Gilbert? 200, said Dorothy. Everyone's getting them. Everyone we know. I'm turning it around. This is going to be a good Christmas. I'm doing it for Etta. And so Dorothy <laughs> sent Gilbert off to get more ingredients, more sugar, <laughs> more Marnier, more cranberries. And when he made his way back, he discovered that Dorothy had already started an assembly line on the dining room table. Each tart goes inside, put the cellophane over top, and stick a card on. The cards are already written, said Dorothy. And so Gilbert started helping her in the workshop. Dorothy was looking at the clock. The day was getting on. We need to start delivering soon, said Dorothy. You take the first batch, go across the river, and everyone on the list who lives on that side, make sure they get one. And so Gilbert started loading up the tarts and the cards into the car and made his way across the La Have River to visit their friends on that side. And then he came back. It was late afternoon, now already three o'clock. Dorothy had everything else put together. Okay, said Dorothy. We've got to get this done. I want to watch the service at 5 p.m. at the church. Now, Gilbert noticed that she wasn't quite as put together as when he had left. <laughs> she had obviously been kind of rushing and scrambling to finish the baking, and, and he wanted to say something to her, but Dorothy was in too much of a rush. What's the matter, said Dorothy. Uh, well, said Gilbert, there's uh, some lipstick on your teeth, and never mind that, said Dorothy. We've got to finish delivering these, these presents. You take that package, I'll take this one. We'll do it on foot. And so Gilbert took the group of gifts to bring up to Drumlin Hills and that end of Glen Allen. And Dorothy took another basket to go and deliver on foot to the houses around their place. When Gilbert got home at five to five, there was no sign of Dorothy. And so we went inside and, and got up the computer and started the service. He listened to Debbie and Sarah playing on the piano together and the wonderful music that was brought from the worship team and the special artists. It was about the time for the sermon to start when Dorothy came in. She was out of breath, huffing and puffing, wearing her long red coat over top of her dress, her shiny black high-heeled boots. She had delivered everything she had planned. Christmas was finally in order. Everything was going to be okay. She came over. She didn't even take her boots off, and she just slumped on the couch beside Gilbert. Did I miss anything, she said. It's okay, said Gilbert. It's on a loop. <laughs> After it finishes, it'll just start again. You can see what you missed at when this is over. And so the minister came up to share his sermon. He began, It's not the kind of Christmas any of us imagined, said the pastor. But today we're going to be reflecting on the Christmas story, a Christmas story that was not really expected by the people of God. We're going to look at Christmas. In the book of Revelation. Oh no, <laughs> groaned Gilbert. What is with the book of Revelation in this pasture? <laughs> Dorothy cuddled in beside him and they began to listen. 
And the pastor opened up the book of Revelation to Revelation chapter 12. And he read the story of the woman and the dragon. It begins, A great sign appeared in the heavens, and a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars, like the twelve tribes of Israel. And the woman, she was pregnant, and she was crying out in the pains of birth, in the agony of giving birth. And then there was another sign in the heaven, writes John of the book of Revelation. A sign that appeared in the heaven, behold, a great red dragon. And the dragon stood before the woman, who was about to give birth. And so when she bore her child, he might be there to devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron that was sure and steadfast. And her child at that moment, was caught up by God and brought to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness. The pastor began to talk about how that story in the book of Revelation summed up the great epic story of Christmas for the early church. That from the earliest times in history, God knew from there in Adam and Eve in the garden that the one who had deceived them, the serpent, the great dragon, would continue to twist the hearts of men and women, to turn their focus away from God and away from one another and to themselves, to corrupt and to fracture what it is to be truly human. That rather than loving, they would be unloving and fearful, and they would live lives in darkness because of the dragon. And yet the prophets of old knew that God had more in store. In fact, there, right in the Garden of Eden, God tells Adam and Eve that he will protect and bless them, and that the seed of the woman, in Genesis chapter 3, the seed of the woman shall crush the serpent's head, and the serpent shall be bruised, and the serpent shall bruise the heel of the son of the woman. This is the story of revelation said the pastor all of this which was foretold by the prophets of old came about in the coming of jesus who was born out of the woman god's chosen people born to set all people free born to rule the nations with love and justice born to be the king of kings the prince of peace and there in bethlehem when Mary and Joseph came together at that time under the star of the heavens. It was then that the dragon moved. For we are told in the Bible, in the book of Matthew, that Herod, the king, out of his own sense of jealousy, his own fear of losing his own place as the ruler of the people of Judea, realized he was outwitted by the Magi, and he was furious And he gave orders to kill all of the children of Bethlehem, all of the young boys under the age of two. But God swept up Mary and Joseph. And through the warning of the Magi, they knew that they were in danger. And they fled to Egypt until God had made a time for them to come back so that Jesus could fulfill his earthly purpose to demonstrate God's love for us in that while we were yet broken and sinful, while we were distant and rebellious, while we were in darkness, the light of God's love would shine into the world as Jesus would defeat the dragon. And not with violence, and not with force, but with sacrifice and love, as he would lay out his own life for his mother and his father, for his brothers and his sisters, and for us. For Jesus was God in the flesh, God with us. As they listened to the pastor speak, Dorothy and Gilbert leaned back on the couch. And there was something not right, something in the pit of Dorothy's stomach that was bothering her. But she couldn't quite name it. She couldn't quite put her finger on it. The pastor went on. This, for many of us, is a Christmas that we did not expect. But you know, that's what Christmas is really supposed to be about. 
In Western culture, we've made Christmas something that it never was, easy and cozy. But the actual story of Christmas is not easy, and it's not cozy. It's dangerous. It's disruptive. There in Bethlehem, when all things were falling apart and the universe was under the shadow of this great red dragon, God moved, and God did something completely unexpected. No, Christmas is not an easy or comfortable story. It is serious. It is sober. And it is important. It was the great uh, songwriter, Charles Wesley, who wrote the carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, who wrote, Because of what Jesus has done, Adam's likeness of face stamped the image, the image of God in its place. The second Adam from above, reinstate us in thy love. That through the work of God coming at Christmas, the incarnation, God was doing something to change the brokenness that had been stamped upon our hearts and to restore within each of us the beauty and the image of God. Dorothy wasn't listening. And Gilbert wasn't listening because Dorothy wasn't listening. There was just something not right, and Dorothy couldn't put her finger on it. And then she did. She looked down at her hands and noticed that on two of her fingers, she was missing her two-inch long red nails. Whatever happened to them, said Dorothy. I'm missing two of my nails. Oh, that's what you're worried about, said Gilbert. Don't worry about that. I noticed that a long time ago. What? said Dorothy. Yeah, this afternoon I tried to tell you, but you wouldn't let me. You lost two of your nails, but don't worry, we can get new ones. Where was I when I lost these nails, said Dorothy. You were in the kitchen, said Gilbert. I, I had just come back, or was it before I left? It was this morning. Maybe it was when I got the coffee. I'm not sure, but you were in the kitchen. Dorothy jumped up from the couch and ran to the kitchen to look around. There were no sign of the nails. She looked in the sink. She looked underneath the counter. She looked on the floor. She went to the bathroom. She checked the bedroom where she had changed. She came all through the house. There was no sign of the nails. And then she looked. On the stovetop, she had left two tarts, clafouti, for her and for Gilbert to have on Christmas morning. Oh, no, said Dorothy. Oh, no. The wheels started turning for Gilbert. Now, now, calm down, Dorothy. Everything's going to be okay. <sighs> they must have fallen in amongst one of the, the tarts, she said. They must have fallen in my batter. Gilbert looked at the glistening red cranberry tarts that she had made and that he had delivered all over Bridgewater. Well, well they, they, no one will probably notice, <laughs> said Gilbert. Are you crazy, said Dorothy? I'm going to become the, the Christmas Eve murderer. We have to get them back. No, no, calm down, said Dorothy. No, said, uh, calm down, said Gilbert. No, said Dorothy. And she grabbed her red coat and threw it over her shoulders like a cape. You go across the river, get them all back, every one. I'll take care of the ones in Glen Allen. Before Gilbert could uh, push back any more or object, Dorothy was out the door, flying down Glen Allen, trying to collect her tarts for fear that she might be choking one of her unsuspecting neighbors. As she was rounding the corner, she saw the lights were on at uh, uh, Karen and Wally Grant's home. And she could see Wally there in the living room, laying out just after the service had finished, all of the sweets and all the goodies that they were going to share that evening. And then she saw Wally picking up one of the bright red cranberry clafouti. No! screamed Dorothy as she ran across their lawn to the front door. She didn't knock, she didn't even push the doorbell, but she burst through the front door of the Grant's home. Wally stood there holding the tart up to his mouth, shocked as Dorothy came flying through the air. Her hands out like claws, like talons, and she batted the tart away from poor Wally Grant. The tart went flying into the Christmas tree and smashed up against all the decorations, disintegrating as it fell down amongst the presents. 
What are you doing, said Karen. I can't explain, I can't explain, said Dorothy. And she went around and grabbed the other tart from the table and held it like she was holding a baby. Are you well, said Karen. I'll tell you about it later, said Dorothy. And she flew back out the door. Wait, called Wally. Well, come back, called Karen. But Dorothy was gone out into the night as the snow started to kind of blow a little bit in the cool air. She disappeared around the bend. The next hour looked much like that as Dorothy was bursting into homes, crashing into Christmases, trying to retrieve her tarts, not giving any explanation to anyone of why she was doing and what she was trying to accomplish. It was later in that evening that uh, Dorothy finally made her way back to the home. That little bit of snow had turned to rain, and she came back towards her driveway, wet and soaked, her coat heavy. Somewhere along the way, probably at Bill and Elizabeth Bootlier's, she had picked up a big blue uh, recyclable garbage bag and had it filled, kind of like the Grinch who stole Christmas, over her shoulder with about 50 crushed tarts. As she made her way to her driveway, she noticed that there was a little crowd gathered there and the red and bl uh, blue lights of the RCMP who were in the driveway. Someone had called saying that they had noticed someone who looked like they were dressed as Santa Claus breaking into people's homes. The police had made their way out to check out the community and had noticed this crowd already gathered at the home of the Wrights. Gilbert was in the, in the lawn trying to explain what was happening when Dorothy walked up. She sat down the bag full of crushed tarts and she said, if you want them, take them. I'm innocent. <laughs> no one had been choked. No one had had a chance to eat one of those delicious tarts that she had found in Etta's recipe book. And the gravity of that was starting to crash in on poor Dorothy all of her great plans, all that she wanted to accomplish, again interrupted, crashing down, taken from her. The police turned off the lights and backed out the driveway and left. And there was this group of friends and neighbors who had come out of concern for what was going on with poor Dorothy. Gilbert invited them to come in, but they said, no, no, we, we can't, it's COVID. But Wally and Karen stayed and they came inside and made sure that Dorothy could sit and put her feet up. They went in, made tea in the kitchen. I think it's okay, said Dorothy. I, I think everything's going to be okay now. No one's going to be hurt. Everything's going to be okay. Of course it is, said Gilbert. Everything's going to be fine. Wally and Karen came in. Would you like some cookies, she said. They're from Frida Selig. That would be great, said Dorothy. The four friends sat together in the living room and they started to laugh. 2020, said Wally. What else would you expect? That evening, after the Grants had left and Dorothy and Gilbert had gone to bed, they were exhausted. And they started to reflect on how good it was that even in the midst of such a chaotic night, that they weren't alone, that there was a community of friends from the church and from their neighbors who cared about them who showed up and wanted them to be well. They woke up early on Christmas Eve morning, much earlier than Gilbert or Dorothy had intended. The phone was ringing. It was that Facebook chime that so many of us are used to. Who is it, said Gilbert, not quite awake. It was Sean. The boys were up and they were opening their stockings. Oh, I, I didn't expect you to call so early. Well, my mom said she wanted the boys to call. Give me the phone, said Dorothy. She took the phone and she and Gilbert sat there in bed, six in the morning, watching the boys there in Quebec, opening their presents, showing what they got from Santa Claus. Gilbert turned and said, Dorothy, I'll be right back. Let me get you some coffee. And so sitting in bed, Dorothy shared in that moment with her kids and with her grandchildren the joy of knowing that we are connected to a family, that none of us need to be alone, whether it is our physical family or our church family or our community, that there are moments in life worth sharing with those around us. Dorothy was talking to the kids when Gilbert was in the kitchen. 
He had made the coffee and saw the two tarts sitting on top of the stove. Breakfast, he thought, but I wonder. He took a knife and cut one of the tarts open. What are the odds, he said. Hey, Dorothy, I think I found your nails. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I give you thanks today that as we celebrate Christmas Eve as family and friends, this Christmas Eve will not go the way that many of us are used to. This Christmas, this whole season into New Year's will look very different. But some things will not change. That in the midst of the pain and the fear and the brokenness of this world, Jesus Christ has come. He has come to overturn the darkness. And that through his death and his resurrection, he gives us a hope which is undimmed. Like the light of a candle which will fill a room with that warm glow. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would descend on our lives and fill our lives with that warmth and with that hope and with that light. God, I thank you this evening that as we share in this service, all those who are listening and all those who are watching, that Lord, through your Holy Spirit, we are connected. We are a part of this body, this family called the church. You are our Father. And God, even in these dark moments, we pray that, Lord, you would come near us, that you would fill us with your peace and expectation that even in times of great interruption, Lord, you do the unexpected and the unimaginable. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. think it is a lie that you are still our dreamless on that first Christmas night cause you had soldiers and politicians overcrowding in your streets and there was chaos and human cruelty and never quite enough to eat and then the baby came baby came I think he cried the way the babies do I think his mama might have cried a little too I bet you Joseph didn't have a clue what to do he was new at fatherhood so I don't think it was a silent night I kind of doubt that all was calm that night but there were those who heard about a light Saw the sight and they understood It was a holy, it was a holy, it was a holy night Such a poor and broken place should be a home for God. And did they gasp to see him shiver, cold and hungry in our skin? Did they tremble? Did they wonder how we deserved a gift like him? Oh, but just the same. The baby came. I think he cried the way the babies do. I think his mama might have cried a little too. I bet you Joseph didn't have a clue what to do. He was new at fatherhood, so I don't think it was a silent night. I got a doubt that all was calm that night. But there were those who heard about a light. Saw the sight and they understood. It was a holy, it was a holy, it was a holy, 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 
It was a holy, it was a holy night. The night that Christ was born. The birth of Jesus celebrated. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world, and everyone went to their town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee, to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all of the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. It's a tradition uh, here at Bridgewater Baptist Church that at this time in a Christmas Eve service that we will come together and we will pass the light from the Christ candle throughout the sanctuary. Uh, whether, whether you're watching at home or listening over the radio, we're going to invite you to take part in the special time of the service, the passing of the light. And so as Cassandra Oaks comes and sings Silent Night, and as we unite our voices together wherever we are, singing Joy to the World, we encourage you, if you can, uh, to light a candle. Uh, let the house lights your, or the lights of your home grow dim and uh, take an opportunity in the twinkling of the lights on the tree or the candlelight uh, that you have with you uh, to celebrate just as those shepherds, shepherds did, as they met the, G the baby Jesus, as they met this family and saw God with us and Emmanuel, they went out from that stable and into the hill country and wherever they went, they shared the light and the good news that Christ is born. Join us in Silent Night. Silent Night, Holy Night, Yeah. 
Once again, we are so thankful that you chose to join us this evening as we celebrate Christmas Eve and the great celebration of Christmas. Now, as we end the service, we go forth in this word of benediction. May the joy of the angels and the gladness of the shepherds, the worship of the wise men, and the peace of the Christ child be with you and yours this Christmas. May Christ, who through his incarnation, gathered into one all things earthly and all things heavenly 
May that same Christ fill you with hope and with peace and with joy and with love and the blessing of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.